Thank you. Um, just a, a quick note. I think there's some people coming in from tracks. There's a lot of moving back and forth. There's some of you standing at the back. There is some empty seats if you're interested. And, and maybe if we can shift towards the aisle a bit if you have space. I was asked by Mehdi to make sure that people had places to sit. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of change happening. Um, I think that's, that's kind of obvious. What I wanted to explore with you was the idea of what it, what it takes to build architectures that support that kind of change or, or innovation. Um, sometimes I do these kinds of talks where I, start, I started with just this idea and I just wanted to explore it. And what I'm going to share with you is actually just my kind of trying to make sense of this space. So it's not meant to be authoritative. But you can follow me on this kind of, you know, weaving in and out and trying to make sense of what all this means and what it could mean for us and what we could actually apply. Uh, I do want to make this point that in terms of these moments where technology changes everything, we've had those before. Right? There's a, a nice paper, I think it's pretty readable, by Bernardo Bates Lazo and Douglas Wood in 2002. They wrote this paper on how information technology changed commercial banking. And part of, in part of it, they define these eras, which I think is a nice way of looking at it. Right, there's the early era where we just get better at communicating with things like telegraph, and then we get specific applications that, you know, do loan calculations or interest calculations on big computers. We start to see IT actually emerge within the bank, and eventually a diffusion where it just does everything. We're probably entering into some new phase in a similar fashion, right? There's something new happening again. Maybe it's the, uh, the era of unbundling or disruption or one of these words that, uh, to be honest, I'm a bit sick of hearing, but it's kind of difficult to describe it any other way. Uh, really simplistically, the model we all seem to be talking about is this, right? This is the simplest version of it. I could draw a much more complicated version, and we saw, we saw a few of those yesterday and and you'll see more today, of lots of boxes with partners and moving pieces. But here's what it really comes down to. What we're identifying is that somewhere there are customers. And we know there will be different communities and segments, but there's customers. And they interact with these user touch points, these experiences. And these experiences are going to be driven by some kind of engine. This is how we've operated for a while. And we're going to see more and more of this. Perhaps some of this gets standardized. Perhaps some of it gets regulated and we're forced to make the engine more available. It has interesting connotations. Uh, last year, I gave a talk at this conference where I talked about this paper that Hegel and Singer did like years ago called Unbundling the Corporation, where they identified that most companies eventually come apart at the seams in three areas, volume, infrastructure, product innovation, and customer relationships. You could make the case that we will start to see that happen again, which is the case I made last year. So we could see some organizations really focus on the idea of competing here, right? Probably some of you are looking at that today. How do we create experiences that people love? Other organizations might decide to focus here. Can we create innovative functions that will differentiate ourselves from all the financial functions others provide? And still others might just compete on price as a commodity. We're going to offer an API in a financial engine, and we're going to reduce costs so we can do it cheaper at a large scale. And some companies are probably going to try and do all of that. Um, business theory says that's probably not going to be possible because these are competing ideas. What all of this tends to have in common is that to compete in this kind of scenario, you're going to need some kind of differentiators. Um, it's tough to compete in this space without innovation. Right? The best user experiences are usually the ones that are very tailored. The best UX is the one that's highly usable, right? so it's niche. Uh, we heard about banking in, in farming yesterday. I mean, you could create a very specific kind of user experience for that 
consumer segment. Traditionally, large organizations like banks and insurance companies have dealt more in the general experience because it costs money to create good UX. So there's a challenge in innovation there. There's a challenge in innovating here, right? How do you create new things? What I think is inevitable is we'll see a continued emphasis on new stuff, right? As businesses grapple with this era of unbundling and rebundling, things coming together and then coming back, we'll be constantly forced to build new things, right? The new products, whether those are mobile apps or financial products, uh, building actual new user experiences, and, and maybe finding new models, finding blue oceans where we've never been able to exploit before, but now we will be able to. When I think about innovation, first of all, uh, I, I recognize that there is a massive amount of information on how to do innovation, probably too much, and it's kind of tough to sort through. But at the highest level, we could claim that it's in two halves, right? There's the, there's the science of like how do you generate ideas, whether they come from the outside or inside, or all these kinds of ways of freeing people up to come up with great ideas. And then there's the execution side. I'll make the argument that most of us in this room focus on, on this side, right? Maybe there's a few of us in here who primarily deal with idea generation, but for a lot of us, our goal in supporting an innovation architecture is really to do this, right? If we can reduce the cost of execution in time and money, we provide an opportunity to increase the number of ideas that can be generated, right? And this is the basic, basic truth. So this is our goal. If it's easy and cheap to execute, then we allow organizations to try many, many different things. If the price of doing something is very high, no one will do anything. So we don't want to create that. Now, don't get me wrong, execution on its own is not enough. But neither is having a business who wants to try new things. We need both. And it's our jobs as technologists and architects to free up the people who want to try things, whether they're inside or outside. It turns out that that's very hard to do. It's actually was, uh, it only took me a few seconds to draw the boxes. But to do this in real life is much more challenging. Uh, we do have examples. Um, Amazon is the poster child for this kind of strategy. Right? Amazon, the company that's always focused on innovation and trying new things. Uh, in 2015, Bezos' letters to shareholders kind of highlighted this. They want to be big. Amazon is a big company. But they're going to act small. They're going to be nimble and do the kinds of things that a startup can. Even going back years, this now really famous story of how Amazon pulled their components apart into loosely coupled services right, in order to foster innovation. So it's certainly a story that most of us want to replicate. It turns out, again, it's not so easy. So really, let's ask this question. How do we change our system? So imagine this is components I've deployed into a production environment. I have stuff that's running. It's a network of components, services. It does something. Uh, the reality is these things don't change much once I deploy them. We've gotten better at it. Uh, sometimes we can scale these things automatically. I might make 16 more of the green components because there's a spike in demand, right? We're getting better at that. Some of us are even getting better at things like fault tolerance. Maybe the red component can self-heal. But just like the weather, you know, we have air molecules and water molecules that don't fundamentally change, they just shift location. Our components don't change their behavior. Once we create them and deploy them, they do what they're designed to do. They don't adapt. So to really build systems that can change freely to reduce the cost of execution, we can't focus only on the deterministic behavior. We have to include the, the maintainer, the developer, the operator, all the, the people, because that's where adaption can really happen. And the problem is, when you start looking at that side, you also have to start considering how these adaptive agents work together, how organizations are structured, 
And the next thing you know, you're talking about a system. You're not talking about a, a runtime deployment or an architecture, you're talking about a big thing. And I think generally that's the trend we're seeing, right? We're more and more acknowledging that to build a truly innovation-driven architecture, we can't simply choose the right architectural patterns. Event sourcing plus CQRS alone doesn't give you what you want. Uh, making services smaller alone doesn't give you what you want, right? Instead, we have to consider all these other parts, organization and culture and process and tools. Uh, and to make it more complicated, as you change one part of the system, there's a knock-on effect to the rest. It means I can't go and find out what the boilerplate answer is. I can't replicate the system I saw somewhere else. So looking at this innovation idea again for a second, in terms of how we go from inception to deployment, what we're saying is we somehow want to shorten this, right? Now, again, I'm not, I'm not including some more complicated things. There's no maintenance here. There's no measurement, no monitoring. But someone has an idea, and we make the idea real. Right? So here's one way to shorten that. Right? How do we make it quicker and cheaper to go from coding to production? When I think of processes like continuous improvement, DevOps, they seem to focus on that. But ask yourself how they do, right? It's actually interesting, CI, CD is actually a safety optimization. What they do is by employing things like test automation, we make it safer to get things up to production. We shorten the time between I implement an idea to its running. By making that safe, I'm getting as close as I can to actually programming the components in production, right? And that seems to be the general optimization trend. It's important to acknowledge that, because there could be a future in five years or 10 years or 15 years in which we don't have to think about safety optimization. Maybe we can actually program production, right? Maybe there are ways of changing this paradigm so fundamentally that we shorten this, not by shortening the time from development to production, but by actually changing production itself. Of course, the other half of this is to shorten the time from Someone has an idea they want to describe to we actually turn it into something deployable. Uh, and in this space, we usually see process taking over, ways of uh, managing work in a better way. If you want to build an innovation architecture today, your goal is really to shorten both sides of that. If you can find a way to do that, you can succeed. So again, those are just pictures. What, what actually makes this difficult in practice? This isn't exhaustive, but in my research, I found there's three, three big overarching problems. First, coordination requirements are too high in most organizations. Across the system, between people, between components, between everything. Uh, asking permission, having to worry about dependencies, all of those are coordination costs. The second thing is change is often laborious. Right? The, to actually go from inception to finishing the code takes time. To actually write test cases and write automation takes time. And probably for, for us in this sector, the biggest challenge is risk. Uh, sometimes I talk about speed and safety for change. The fastest way to get a change implemented is to just implement it. Right? Don't test it. Don't check it. Just deploy it. Uh, in the financial services world, we have such a, a high perception of risks that it ends up kind of slowing us down. So that's what makes these things hard to change. And of course, there's this whole impact of if I change something here, something else might get impacted. But there's a lot of emerging trends that seem to be addressing those three specific challenges. So taking this, this model, and this was a model, by the way, I used initially to help me understand the microservices world. Taking this model and kind of rolling it out along those three areas of concern I described. If we talk about just the service itself, sorry, let me go back, the service itself within an architecture. So solution means architecture, the macro level. Uh, if I want to reduce coordination, what do I do? I push towards decentralization. 
maybe I remove ESB components and I make components talk to themselves, manage their own messaging integration and coordination. Maybe I uh, decentralize data so there's not a single shared data source that everyone needs to talk to. Right? That's how we reduce coordination at the architectural level. I can reduce the work involved in maintaining and designing architecture maybe by making architecture that's more evolvable, that's more change friendly. And I might be able to re reduce the risk of changing architecture by making things that are more adaptive, embracing the way that Netflix talks about their architecture, for example, amongst others. At the service level, we have a similar set of trends, right? To reduce coordination, we start drawing boundaries around things, which is a nicer way of saying people are trying to make things smaller, right? We see boundaries come up a lot. Uh, in terms of reducing labor, more and more we're seeing the idea of autonomy of the implementation, right? You make a service and it's only the API that people see, you decide what happens underneath, which allows you to use the right tools for the right job to get things finished quicker. And finally, from a risk perspective, we have this trend towards deployment of components, independent pieces, replaceability, that reduce perhaps the risk that there's problems I introduce within the service. Probably most important, I think, for this generation of innovation architecture is the process and tools. We're seeing a trend towards smaller units of work. Uh, processes like Agile and Lean, they all have uh, nuances, but fundamentally, most of them come down to reducing what we're looking at or what an individual needs to uh, implement. We're seeing increases in work automation and test automation as well. From a culture perspective, we can reduce coordination if we increase cultural values like trust, Hand in hand with automation, we see a lot of organizations embracing tool making as a cultural trait. So we don't just buy products and use tools, we actually make tools that work for us, that fit our needs. And finally, from a risk perspective, moving away from validation towards accountability and responsibility. And finally, we have the organization itself. The smaller teams, increased autonomy, and maybe a surprise, organizationally, I think the emerging trend for risk reduction is skilled workers. Right? So this isn't necessarily the scorecard, like you do these things and now you've got the innovation architecture. But this is what people seem to be doing at the moment. Right? This is what we hear a lot about. If I level back up now and try and say, okay, we've got all these things, I think we can perceive it in this way. There's three things you need to do as an architect, apparently, to be the best architects in the world. You have to know how to define boundaries now. You need to know what the size of everything should be. The size of teams, the size of services, but also things maybe a little bit uh, that you hadn't considered as boundaries, the size of a release audience, pilot programs, uh, A-B testing, all of that is boundary definition. This has become incredibly important for us, how you define boundaries. The second thing is you have to establish the right standards. A misnomer is that as you start going down this road, standardization is bad. In fact, you might end up implementing more standards. Remember, a standard can be over here, this is how we do this kind of work. Or everyone's APIs should at least look like this so we can have some form of shared integration. The trick is which standards and how many. And then the last thing that you have to address is the coordination mechanisms. How are you going to build this system and get the pieces to talk, whether that's architecturally or organizationally? You now have a wide array of tools to choose from. And each choice you make comes with a cost and a knock-on effect. So for example, if I, if I take the automation route, automation can help you because it reduces that labor effort, reduces risk, but keep in mind, if I build a lot of machinery, now I have to change that machinery if I fundamentally change the system. Right? This is a real cost, and maybe that's a future cost that some organizations haven't hit yet. If I increase autonomy, everyone has more personal responsibility, I increase the requirement for skilled workers. 
The companies that we say we want to be like, the Amazons, the Netflix, hire the top 1% of the world. That doesn't sound scalable to me, right? So I don't know, do we just make every worker better or is there a different type of dial that you need to change? And then finally, there's a cost to going small, right? We talk about microservices. At the surface, people think, well, we'll just make things small. But the smaller we make things, the more we increase the cost of coordination and management. So that's the kind of model I use in my head to make sense of what an innovation architecture could be. The, the key takeaway, I think, for you is this. Um, we wrote this book about microservice architecture. And part of the journey in writing this was to figure out what it was. And what turned out to be true were the companies that we admired in this space were not overly concerned with meeting the definition of a microservice architecture. Instead, they focused on something that we, we called the microservices way. They found ways to do change with speed and safety at scale. If you're going to focus on innovation, right, you're going to really need to understand this, this kind of underpinning model I described. Uh, and as technology changes, things that used to be expensive become cheap. The interaction costs go down. You have to be ready to embrace new models, new ways of working. And you'll only know which things work if you can understand that fundamental idea which I've just described, right? How do we reduce execution? What is execution made of? And then how does that free up ideas? So that's my take on the architecture of innovation. Uh, I'll open it up for any questions. So first of all, uh, thank you very much, Ronnie.